Office Space is a 1999 comedy directed by Mike Judge. Yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you about the plot. Little in joke there for people that have seen the film. Anyway, <laughs> Peter Gibbons is a bored, frustrated office worker, fed up with the tedious, mind numbing work, overbearing managers, and boring commute. Um, he attends a hypnotherapy session in the hope that it will sort of change his attitude to work, make him maybe care less or imagine that he's somewhere else and not, not doing his boring job. Unfortunately, the hypnotherapist dies of a heart attack and before he can snap Peter out of his uh, relaxed state. So he does get the desired effect. He does have a different attitude to work, but his attitude is that he just doesn't care anymore and doesn't bother turning up. And when he does turn up, he doesn't really do any work. But it does give him the confidence to ask a waitress out at the local restaurant who he uh, takes a liking to. Meanwhile, the company's brought in some consultants, which is always a bad thing, in order to trim the workforce. And uh, two of Peter's closest colleagues, Samir and Michael Bolton, no relation, are on the list to be let go. So the f Furious, the three hatch a plan to um, embezzle some money out of the firm, hopefully in a way that, that shouldn't be noticed by anyone. So obviously, yeah, this is Office Space, written by, or written and directed by Mike Judge, based on a short, Milton, that yep. he created. I think he, uh, around this time that he created this animation, he created, is it, um, what's the first, the Beavers and Butthead? It was the very first time you saw Beavers and Butthead in an animation, and he created that, and then he created Milton and some other ones as well. And obviously this is that's where this comes from, mm. is, is Milton, which is the character in this, played in this by Stephen Root. Uh, and he's the guy who just kind of has been forgotten somewhat. Well, it turns out he's actually been made redundant he's been many made years redundant, before. Yeah. For a clerical error, I meant he, they carried on paying him. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. and they keep moving his desk and uh, he won't give up his stapler and he can't barely understand what he says it's a great film Office Space I mean I saw it I don't know when I saw it years and years ago mm. and I think what I like about this is it's very I mean, it's very observational it's that kind of ob observational satire which I, I always quite mm. enjoy and uh, it's, it's a bit dark I mean it's, it's interesting that Office Space came out a couple of years before The Office mm. Obviously, the vehicle that put Ricky Gervais on the map and mm. then went on to become a big success in America as well, uh, which apparently was linked to... Someone yeah, else. so Greg Daniels, who worked with Mike Judge on King of the Hill, worked on the US version of The Office as well. Yeah, so, so there was a bit of a link there. Yeah, yeah. Both shows are very observational. Mm. Uh, you know, The Office and Office Space are both very ob observational about working in a, an office space environment. Mm. And I think interesting, you know, I mean, I have, in my time, I worked in temp offices... And so watching The Office in this country was like, oh, God, that's so, <laughs> it's so like real life mm -hmm. if you've ever worked in that kind of situation. And obviously, the office, office space is an American office, but it's still very similar. It's, you know, it's a satire of that kind of white collar, middle mm -hmm. class America. And it does it very well. And it's, you know, the, the kind of, I mean, I think maybe office space is a little bit more characterized. Yeah. Because yeah. I suppose uh, Mike Judge worked in cartoons originally than The Office is. The Office is more realistic, plus it's, it's filmed as a documentary. But there's definitely links here, mm. clearly. And uh, it's just absurdist humour as well. I, I really like Office Space. It's it's just, yeah, it's got some it's got some great gags in it. Yeah, yeah. And the whole thing with the, with the running gag with the printer, which yeah. you know, we've all suffered with paper jams and Absolutely. all sorts of errors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so taking it out and the crap out of it with a bat is yeah, something we'd all like to do, I think. Kind of, it feels like a bit of a relic of a bygone age now because it kind of everyone does, working it? from home and yeah, and that it's yeah. I mean, I, I worked in an office for most of the jobs I've had, and I've never really been a fan of it to be honest. It sucks the life out of you. <laughs> so, I think most of the times I've worked in offices, they've all been temp jobs. Uh, I've had other jobs in offices, but they were cooler jobs in offices. You can get cool jobs in offices yeah. as well. Did you ever work anywhere that had cubicles? Like, I don't know. Do we have cubicles in this country? Well, that's more of an American thing, isn't well, it? Well, this is what I was... Or whether it's just a movie thing. Or a movie thing. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it must exist. But yeah. I can't say... You know, having worked in a few offices, I've never worked in one that is like that. But you have, you know, dividers, perhaps, between them. But they're only... And they're not blocking. You can see the person. You can see opposite. the person opposite. I've never had a full cubicle where once you're sat down, that is it. You are completely enclosed. No, because so. what, because what's interesting with this film is, I mean, obviously one of the things that's satisfying is boredom. 
Yeah. And, you know, the fact that you can be in this little cubicle and clearly just be bored because yeah. there's no one around you to talk to. Well, that's I why mean, I wondered whether it was a movie thing because obviously it does block everything out. When Once the camera is down on the level with somebody who's sat down, there's nothing in the background. No. So I guess that works for... There's no sort of distracting things going on in the background. It, it, it helps sort of convey isolation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it helps... If they're, you know, at one point they stand around in a cubicle and have a conversation, so yeah. it helps to sort of contain that. Yeah, um, it leads to a great joke when he pushes yeah, down yeah. the thing and he finally like can breathe and he yeah, can yeah. see the exactly, world outside yeah. his window. So and it's it good for hiding that. it as well. That's so too. if you don't want many, to, there if you are don't many want to be films, spotted by a manager. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of other films where they hide the Matrix when he's running away the from Matrix, the agents. Yeah, that's that's a good one. There's a there's a Christian Slater one that I watched. It's about someone who who, who pulls a gun in an office. He's oh, right, he's yeah. going to pull a gun in an office. Someone else does it before him, and he saves the day. Something like right. that. That was a funny <laughs> film. But again, I think they use cubicles yeah, yeah. to kind of hide and walk around. So yes, you're right. It may be just a movie trope. Yeah, Americans, let us know. Yeah, do if you, you have work, cubicles? Yeah, if you worked in an office with <laughs> cubicles, yeah, let us know down below in the comments. Um, exactly. To know. Yeah. I mean, there must. I don't know. There must be a thing, and there must. We must have them here. Maybe it depends on what you do. Maybe I don't know where I work. I don't know, there, is a, there is a call center where I work, and they don't. They don't have cubicles. Yeah, and in fact, so, all the times I used to when I used to work in London, obviously you go past. Off, I can't believe we're talking spending this much time talking about cubicles and <laughs> offices, but the train would go past uh, lots of offices going up into London. Mm. And you'd look in the windows, never saw, saw no. tables and tables and tables of computers, never, never saw any. cubicles. No. Well, yeah, but also, in, in Amer- nothing against Americans, but obviously, you know, gun crime is a big thing. <laughs> People going mad in offices <laughs> is a thing. Yeah, yeah. Without cubicles, it takes away the stress of being isolated. Yeah. So maybe... Maybe get know. rid of them. Get rid maybe of they're them. there for protection. Maybe they're bulletproof. <laughs> I don't know. There's so many questions yeah. I have about cubicles now, There's but so we should move questions. on. We should move on to the actual film in question. <laughs> so. And it's Ron Livingston, who turned up in Band of Brothers yep. a year later, playing yep. similar, kind of similar... He's a bit bored in that as well, <laughs> actually. <laughs> he just does that sort uh, of... Uh, he does that yeah. kind of, yeah, bored and... I mean, it's a bit like being stoned, this, actually. <laughs> he goes to the, the psychotherapist and then, you know, he's just stoned for the rest of the movie. Mm. I like it because it is that kind of observational... Mm. Humor and plus it's 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 filled with this quite amazing soundtrack. I mean, it's all kind of um, it's hip hop, you know, gangster, yeah, rap, yeah. a lot of gangster rap in there, and there's some very funny scenes. That the the opening scene, of course, so they're they're going to work, and uh, Peter Ron Livingston's character is stuck in a traffic jam, which is just annoying because you know he obviously he looks out the window and there's this old old man walking along the street who's obviously going quicker. Than the traffic with a Zimmer frame, with a Zimmer frame as well, which is very funny. And then his mate, who you obviously meet, is uh, Michael Bolton. He's in the car behind, and he's playing. He's kind of rapping along to this gangster rap music, which is very funny because then, of course, this this black guy walks up the side of his car and he like clicks down his uh, his his door lock. Uh, It's just little moments like that, and I think it's got a lot of kind of great gags. Plus, it's got the the satire in there as well, and there's some great one. I mean, it's you know probably. A very often quoted film. Mm. There's many great lines in there with uh, Gary Cole yeah. and his uh, and TPS his... reports. Yeah, and go ahead and do this for me. <laughs> yeah. So obviously in the film, they um, the thing that happens takes place later on is that they decide to, as you say, embezzle mm. this this money, and they do that by installing a computer virus again, which makes this film feel very old because obviously they're working off you know those old square computer discs. <laughs> And you know, big fat monitors and just heavy equipment. I mean, computers in the computers in the nineties was heavy. You know, yeah. heavy printers, heavy machinery, uh, just lots of plastic everywhere. And uh, and so they've been, there's this great scene where the three of them they install this this computer virus, and of course they're playing it. You know, they they're kind of acting as gangster as they can be and looking all shifty and but trying to you know work under the under the cover of the cubicles. Michael Bolton sits there and he's kind of looking around and then, and then this woman walks past and she's like, hello, Michael Bolton. And he just totally breaks the fourth wall, looks directly into the camera. And it's just his his whole mannerisms is just, you know, it's just a really great, funny moment. And it's as, as moments like that, that just, you know, it, it, they still make me laugh today. Mm. And, I, and I just really enjoy its humour. I mean, I watched Idiocracy. Uh, as well this week, also by Mike Judd, which isn't quite as funny, but it's still it's got that same really interesting observational humour. Mm. I think what's interesting about Mike Judge actually, maybe his films. He's done three films. He did this one, Idiocracy, and Extract, and all three films they all seem. I haven't seen Extract, but they all seem to be. I mean, they're about kind of everyday guy, everyday mm. Joes. 
you know, living these average lives <clears throat> that kind of stick it to the man a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, idiocracy. I mean, at the beginning of idiocracy, Luke Wilson is also, he kind of has a desk job. He's in the army, but he has a desk job. He sits there watching TV all day, trying to be kind of, stay out of, out of the way. He doesn't yeah. want to be bothered. The same with um, Peter in this one. He doesn't really want to be bothered. He wants to be kind of kept out of the way. Just get on everyday life. Um, so they're kind of similar themes going on in his films, you know. I mean, even Beavers and Butthead to a point. I mean, they're, they're a bit bored with life. They just yeah. sit there and kind of, you know, take the mickey out of one another. And, uh, they're and when of, they're in school, they do nothing but mess about. They do about. nothing but mess about. So it's kind of that kind of that everyday guy. Yeah. Yeah, the, these consultants that come in and, and sort of try and trim the fat, shall we say, from the from the company. They're played by John C. McGinley and Paul Wilson. John C. McGinley was in Seven that we, did, that we covered <laughs> recently. Was, yeah. Not in it very much, but um, yeah, I mean, he's always great <laughs> interviewing the staff. What, what is it you do? And, and half of them can't really answer. And then when they get Peter in, he just is like, you know, he's at his doesn't care stage. And somehow that gets him a promotion. <laughs> Probably quite accurate, to be honest. Probably, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, John C. McGinley. He's kind of the great. He's 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 a very good kind of subtle actor. I mean, he's mm. very subtle here, uh, and but he's just he doesn't do much. But he's very funny and he's very good and he's very believable. I mean, there's a great scene here where they, you know, obviously they interview Mike Michael Bolton. It's just so. I mean, every time that comes up, obviously. I mean, you know, his cat Michael Bolton laments the fact that he is called Michael Bolton, and of course. John C. McGlynn, you know, they're like, they look down and he's like, oh, Michael Bolton. <laughs> Any relation? Which is, I mean, even that's hilarious because yeah, yeah. obviously Michael Bolton wouldn't have a relation called cool Michael, Michael Bolton. Bolton. <laughs> but it's just, it's just so funny because it just annoys him even more. <laughs> it's just such great straight acting. Mm. That's the other thing. I, I may have mentioned this before. You know, my, you know, we, occasionally we've spoken about my granddad who was an actor uh, and he did a lot of comic acting. And I remember he always said to me, the best way to play comedy is to play it straight. Yeah, yeah. If you play it straight, it is it's more funny. If you try and be funny, it's not very funny. Yeah. Gary Cole here, who plays it absolutely straight, <laughs> and it's just so funny. I mean, maybe um, Milton, he's kind of playing it more in a, in a more kind of caricature way, but it's still, you know, it, the whole film is kind. Of, it's a straight film that's very funny, yeah. and I think that's why it works so well. Uh, and it still holds up, even though it feels yeah, so definitely. dated. Yeah. And we should mention Jennifer Aniston. She's the yeah. love interest in there. I mean, she's kind of playing... It's, Jennifer Aniston's weird. I mean, I was never the biggest fan of Friends. She's kind of playing... She always plays... She plays that similar role. But she's very funny. Yeah, she's I mean... She's a good I, comedy actress, she, I think. No, definitely, definitely. I mean, she was cast... The studio wanted a big name. And obviously, you know, she was in sort of Friends' heyday at the time. That's why she was in it. But, she was, you know, she's great in it. Around, you know, after Friends, sort of during Friends, she got sort of stuck into doing too many rom-coms, well, I think, yeah, which a lot she, of these actresses do, unfortunately. Yeah. She definitely can do... Well, I mean, obviously, Friends is a comedy. Yeah. But, um, you know, yeah. all credit to her. Yes, she's there because the studio wanted her for a bit of star power. But, yeah, so but, she's here because of her fame yeah. from, at that point, Friends. So she's kind of, yeah, that's why she's given that role. But she's, I mean, she's always very funny. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a great scene here where, where he first out, asks her out and he goes to the restaurant next door and invites her to the restaurant next door. <laughs> and so, of course, she goes, because it's lunchtime, she goes in and she's like, am I even allowed in here? Because I'm wearing the kind of the enemy's cost uh, uniform in a way. Um, and uh, as she sits down and he's like, you know, he, he doesn't, she notices their uniform and says, mm. their uniform's nicer than my uniform. And he's like, oh, I like your uniform. And the way she looks at him, again, it's great timing, but she, she makes his faces mm. and she's very funny. And I think she's, she is a great kind of comedic actress. Um, and although she's not really in it a lot, it, she's, she's, she works well here. And I, yeah. I, think, she, I think they're a nice pairing. Mm. Uh, I was reading an interview with Ron Livingston and he said he was a bit starstruck when he, when he first met her. <laughs> I think they they work well here. It's, yeah. it's you know, good chemistry. So yeah, there's, there's a whole sort of running gag with her flair, which she has to, which are basically badges that she has to wear on her braces for her uniform. And I think there's a minimum of 13 pieces of flair that they have to wear. And there's another guy who has 37 pieces of flair. Yeah. So the manager, which is play, who's played by Mike Judge, he doesn't really tell her off, but he constantly says... You know, you can wear more than the minimum. Express yourself. Yeah, express <laughs> yourself. And it, again, it's, you know, obviously it's played for laughs and the guy's a bit exaggerated, but it, it's so, it speaks to sort of real people and situations where it's, just, it's so phony and yeah. uh, you're just serving people food. Who cares yeah. what, what badges yeah. you've got on your flipping uniform? You just want to go, do your job and go home. This film actually had an effect in real life um, because TGI Fridays used to have this flare thing going on. 
And then once well, the film came out, people started to bring it up all the time. So they uh, they oh, abolished it. Amazing. And and the same with with the stapler yeah, that, that's that the, Milton. Yeah covets and well he has and he doesn't want to let go but it's this special red stapler made by a swing line or a real you know oh, i don't know if they make more than staplers but <laughs> certainly make staplers but they didn't do it in red so they had to paint one in red which Stephen root was grateful for because he wears these massive thick glasses which you couldn't really see properly out of i think he had to wear contacts just so he could see properly out of them. And even then, he couldn't really see very well. So the fact that it was red meant that when he reaches out, he could actually see see where it was. But then they, after the film, you know, they they wouldn't provide them with a red one because they didn't make them in red. After the film came out, they got loads of requests for red staplers. So they then started making them. Amazing. So, uh, I mean, it didn't do amazing business at the box office, particularly. It was a bit of a flop. But, you know, it had real world consequences. Yeah. (laughs) And, yeah, definitely found a home on sort of video. And, and everything. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I supp- I supp- it's become a cult. It was yeah. one of those films that you know wasn't a big success in the box office. I mean, well, we'll talk about the DVD because yeah. we've both got the same DVD. Yeah, snap. Um, and there's nothing. There's like no. a theatrical trailer, and that's it. Well, scene selection and interactive menus. Don't forget that you know they're listed under special yeah, features. So, sorry, I forgot the most important part. <laughs> not, not the film. You've got to select your scenes. Yeah, exactly. And interact with the menus. So exactly, but because there's nothing on there apart from the trailer. Uh, which kind of comes into the next, the next bit. We're going to talk about the poster. We don't often talk about posters no, on the no. channel. So the, uh, I mean, obviously this is it's, it's iconic. This poster actually featuring. I mean, in the original cinema release mm. didn't have Milton on it. It was just this kind of weird figure with uh, post-it notes all over his body, which Mike Judge hated. Yeah. I mean, he hated. I mean, it's a bit marketing. weird to be fair, isn't it's it? It's a bit weird. I mean, Mike Judge hated the concept, uh, the marketing campaign for it. I mean, obviously it's based on Milton, so mm. I think he wanted to feature that more. I don't know how that may have sold in this country. I mean, this, I, I think it's quite an iconic poster. I found this really interesting. Um, there's a book called Sell Your Own Damn Movie, <laughs> which is written by Lloyd Kaufman, who, of course, is the co-founder of Troma Entertainment. Mm-hmm. I'll just read it from this. As I mentioned earlier in the book, one of the most important pieces of marketing you can create for your movie is the poster. An effective poster should communicate the most interesting and marketable ideas a film has to offer. What a poster should not do is make your movie look like a boring piece of shit. <laughs> unfortunately, <Fair> <laughs> unfortunately, that's the direction that designers of the office space poster decided to go in. In other words, office space has a fucking awful poster. <laughs> a visage of what looks like a yellow Michelin man who, you know, on closer examination, is made out of post-its. Standing against a sparse background with the too concise tagline, work sucks. And combined, this communicates three ideas to me, confusing work and sucks. And even John C. McGinley himself said it looked, to him, it looked too much like Big Bird from yeah. Sesame Street yeah. and wouldn't refuse to go and see the movie. I mean, it's interesting because I, I, I quite like it. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you anything about the movie. No. It's, it's probably gone on to become quite iconic. And, mm. you know, I, I saw it and thought, oh, that looks quite interesting. So it kind of worked for me, although obviously I, I knew who Mike Judge was. But it's just, I think it's interesting how, I mean, obviously, you know, the art of marketing is similar to the art of making a movie, but that making movies is very personal. And obviously it was Mike Judge's idea. It was his, it was his, you know, he wrote it and it was his concept and he directed it. I like the poster. I think it's iconic, but yes, it doesn't have anything to do with no. the movie whatsoever. No. So, I mean, if you, if you want the... Oh. A disc version, then I would go for the for the Blu-ray that was released in the states, so special edition with flair. I don't know how many pieces of flair. Whether it's the regulation thirteen or it's got more, I don't know. But um, it's got like trivia track and there's some games on there and deleted scenes. It is region A locked though, but it's very cheap, so um, you can pick it up. But it's also you watched it on Amazon, didn't you? Yes, and yeah. it's on Disney Plus as well. What I did notice is that Amazon have the widescreen version. Uh, sorry, nah. Disney Plus have the widescreen version. Amazon have a full frame That's version. That's right. For some yeah, reason. it's so, weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I uh, don't know why that is, but uh, yeah, I don't suppose it will hang around on Amazon for much longer. It's obviously just you know an agreement that was already in place, and once that expires, that'll be it. It'll be on Disney Plus forever. It is a great movie. If you don't know it, I absolutely de- you know recommend going out there because it's sure to make you chuckle. Yeah. Especially, you know, yeah. If you've ever worked in an office, yeah. or if you've ever watched The Office, yeah, <laughs> then yeah, give it a go. So that was Office Space, and as always, if you enjoyed the video, let us know in the comments below. Hit the subscribe button up there, and don't forget to push that bell for notifications. There's other videos to check out over there. Come and find us over on social media, and join us again soon for another video.